All right. Thank you very much, Banton. That was a good answer. Uh, who else from here? Ions, Kristen? Yes, sir. One of the causes yes, that we would have looked at. Pardon? One of the causes of the Cuban Revolution. Uh, economic control, sir. Tell me about the economic control. Um, like for example, the transport systems, they own over 50% of that, including telephone, like telephone. Then how was that a call? Why own that to have fifty percent? Well, because like the investments went back to the US anyway, so they wouldn't be really Developing, I guess. Eh? All right, very good. Go ahead, Pamela Lawrence. Sarah, just adding on to what she said, because like the US was like heavily, um, what do you call that, invested in Cuba's economy. Most mm -hmm. of the jobs were occupied by Americans, and so many um Cubans did not have a job. Very good, very good point. All right, thank you very much, Blake. Dave, yeah, Blake is here. Hello, Davia. Uh, one of the causes for me, please, of the Cuban Revolution. Uh, unemployment. Yes, tell me, how would you link unemployment to the revolution? Um, the U.S. as the economy. Mm -hmm. The U.S. will like bring over their people to work um, in Cuba and mm -hmm. the Cubans wouldn't have any like employment. That makes sense. Yes, it makes sense. You are very much correct. All right, so unemployment in Cuba was also a cause because the Americans would have controlled most of the, the jobs. But there's also other things that would have caused unemployment in Cuba. Other than the Americans control most of the jobs. Some of the jobs in Cuba, go ahead for me, Miller. Sir, when you finish, can I give a call, please? All right, no problem. Any any other problem? That's unemployment. Corey, Corey. Sir, sir, would the discrimination that we have against the Cubans cause unemployment too? Yes, discrimination could also link to 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 unemployment, yes, because they didn't want Cuban, they wanted white people to work in the different industries in Cuba, in Cuba, the American industries. But what about the sugar workers in Cuba? Emmins? Sir, they could be considered as seasonal. Um, that could be considered as seasonal unemployment like meaning that throughout certain times of the year they wouldn't the labor required would be needed more than other times of the season all right very good and you know that sugar crop is very seasonal and so it is not every single time or right throughout the year you are going to have full uh employment when is the most busiest time on the sugar estate When was the busiest time on the sugar estate? At what point in the time when you are? It was the, like harvesting time? Sure, harvesting uh, crop over. Yes, crop, crop over or harvesting time. That was very, the busiest time. And that is usually in December, November, December, January. All right, very good point. Go ahead for me, Miller, for the next point. Oh, sir, our next cause of the... Revolution was um full Hensio Batista. So, Very good. So sir, he was like a puppet president for the 
he was a dictator first of all sir mm -hmm. and he was like a puppet president for the united states and well yeah wait yes sir so then he was very corrupt and he only he didn't you know like what um the president or whatever was supposed to do sir he only brought down the people and he was very corrupt and cuba wasn't you know growing it was like that he would kill anybody who opposed him and i guess the people were tired of that sir yes they were tired of the dictatorship and, and the abuse sir, by go ahead for me sir batista also um he stole money from mm -hmm. the people and used it for his own personal benefits and yeah, sir, it was just terrible with him as a leader. So that, you know, pushed the people. Very good. Excellent point. Anyone sir, else? Me, sir. Poverty. Go ahead for me. Sir, another cause of the Cuban Revolution was poverty. Yes. So um, most of the people, they were unemployed, as they said, and living conditions were horrible. Mm-hmm. And running water and the electrical light um, were limited, mm -hmm. and, and sanitation facilities were also limited. And rural persons lived horribly, and health conditions were also deplorable. And doctors were paid low wages. Very low wages. Very good. Very good. Any other cause, ladies? Very good point. Any other calls for the Cuban Rev? Sir? Go ahead for me. Sir, would one be poor election practices? Yes, how would you explain that? Very good sir, point. Sir, I'd explain that um, every election from 1902 was rigged. Rigged, yes. And explain to the, the examiner what you mean by rigged they weren't fair um no. the elections weren't fair and the people would you say the people who were to win they didn't win our or it mm -hmm. was manipulated. it was manipulated manipulated very good and that's how sir, you explain go ahead for me sir would one be the influence of Phil castro very good tell me about how we would have influences Sir, I don't really know what he formed a group. It's the anti-imperialism. Yes. yes, sir. Yes, develop sir, the so point. Based on what um the um I don't remember who it was was saying about um the rigged election, sir. So mm -hmm. even though they went as far as to try to keep an election sir they already had in their minds who they want they already had who they wanted to win but they were trying to show face you know what i mean sir so yes very good yes all of that is correct and then another way in which you could defend the point about unemployment you could say that 37 point five percent of cubans were unemployed or if you want it, let it seem very high. You can say approximately 40% of Cubans were unemployed, right? So when you're writing the cause in the exam, you ensure that you said approximately 40%, because 40%, 37 is high, no? 37.5 is, is almost 38. But if you say um, approximately 40, my goodness, you know it kind of... <laughs> Hi. Yes, exaggerate the figure. Go Hyperbole, ahead, sir. Hyperbole. We use, we use it on the figurative devices, man. Yes. Go ahead, Tommy White. Sir, you did say approximately after all. Yes. But you know, the, yes, approximately would you know, which which is almost. But but you know, once people say the party, they are not really looking at sir. the word approximately. Go ahead for me, wife. You have another point? All right, ladies. So that is 
the causes. So are we comfortable looking at the causes of the Cuban revolution? Sir, can you, uh, sir, how would you explain um, prostitution or you wouldn't make that as a point by itself? I would, well, sir? you could put it as a point by itself or, but I would put it on the unemployment. High unemployment. Okay, I sir. Would, because so I would I'm not work. Repeat. Sir, I was saying that because they don't have any work or any job, they're going to do yes. everything to try and earn some money. So money. Of course, into that. Yes, and because they were in poverty. So I, I, I would use, I would link po prostitution to poverty or prostitution to, I, to the I, unemployment in Cuba. Which would, uh, that would where you would have include prostitution as part of the explanation as a cause. And why the, why the anti-imperialists didn't like the fact that the females were, you know, involved, involved in prostitution. And anywhere you have the army, there's always prostitution. And if you, when we study all the other territories uh, in Cuba, all other territories that the U.S. would have involved and sent their military in, you are going to see that prostitution is a serious problem uh, that the American soldiers would have involved in, especially in some territories, the white man, white soldiers, yeah. They want white soldiers and not only white soldiers, white, the Americans come with what? Money. Money, very good. What type of money? Money. What type of money? American dollars. <laughs> the American dollars, yes. And so people were very, very interested in the American dollar. When we look at when we go uh, when we look at the US in Trinidad, so we're going to look at the US in Trinidad. Uh, I'm going to share a story with you with persons in Trinidad who basically wanted the US dollars. And not only the US dollars, a lot of people got involved with the soldiers because they wanted to go where? Foreign. Yes, they wanted to go to America and to live in America. It was a way for them to escape their situation in their country. Cause, right? So no. very. Repeat. Sir, I was saying it's so like something that's happening today. It is happening today, same thing. There's nothing that has changed under the sun. Not a thing. All right, ladies, I'm going to share a short clip with you about the course of the Cuban Revolution, and then I will go into the course uh, or the timeline of the Cuban Revolution. And then after that, we're going to look at the reasons why Fidel was successful. So we have enough, we have enough time, good. So before that, yeah, I should show you that and then I show you. When he came to Jamaica, when Fidel came. Sir, he came to Jamaica? Enough time, man, yes. 
Sure is he dead. Yes, yes. All right, so let us show you a clip in from BBC. I wanted to learn somewhere where I could go anywhere else in the world. I'm still able to treat other Korean people in New York City. I love my job. With the number one bringing in desperately needed goods to beat the Renunciar a la revolución. Renunciar al socialismo. Rendir. Fidel Castro was the world's longest serving dictator. Although the United States often tried to get rid of him, in the end, Fidel Castro outlasted nine American presidents. He was a constant irritant to them, a communist leader right on their doorstep. Castro was determined to overthrow the American backed Batista regime, which happily profited from the corruption and gross inequality of a haven for the playboy rich dominated by organized crime. So Castro and his band of revolutionaries masterminded a classic guerrilla campaign from their mountain base. On January the 2nd, 1959, the rebel army entered Havana. Castro had triumphed, Batista had fled, and Cuba had a new government, with the legendary Che Guevara among its members. Its promise to give the land back to the people and defend the rights of the poor. Soon afterwards, Castro went to America, saying he wanted to be friends with his powerful neighbor, but he felt rejected when President Eisenhower wouldn't see him. Snubbed by the Americans, Castro claimed he was driven into the arms of the Soviet Union and its leader, Nikita Khrushchev. Cuba had now become a Cold War battleground. April 1961, the Bay of Pigs. This was America's doomed attempt to topple Castro by recruiting a private army of Cuban exiles to invade the island. But the young revolutionary was more than a match for them. Under his command, Cuban troops repulsed the invaders, killing many and capturing a thousand. The evidence is incontrovertible. A year later, the stakes were far higher. American reconnaissance planes discovered Soviet missiles on their way to sites in Cuba. The world was suddenly staring into the abyss of all-out nuclear war. Unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The superpowers stood eyeball to eyeball, but it was Khrushchev who blinked first pulling his missiles out of Cuba in return for a secret withdrawal of US weapons from Turkey. Castro, though, had become America's enemy number one. The CIA frequently tried to assassinate him, most infamously with a cigar packed with explosives. Other schemes were even more bizarre. This was a bright idea that if we uh, uh, got a certain powder to him, if he put it on, this would uh, his beard would fall out and the Cuban people would all fall over laughing and he would be ridiculed. But while America plotted, the Soviet Union poured money into Cuba. It bought the bulk of the island's sugar harvest and Russian ships crammed into Havana Harbor, bringing in desperately needed goods to beat the American blockade. But when Soviet communism collapsed, so too did Cuba's economy. The little island faced economic collapse. Tempers grew shorter as the food queues grew longer. By the mid-90s, many Cubans had had enough. Thousands took to the sea in a waterborne exodus to Florida. It was a crushing vote of no confidence in Fidel Castro. And the Florida exiles became the focus of a vigorous campaign to undermine Castro's regime. Still, Castro could be proud of some of his achievements. High-quality medical care, freely available for all. Literacy rates matching leading industrialized countries. But in 2006, Fidel Castro was forced by illness to hand power to his younger brother, Raul. He initiated a program of reforms without undoing all his brother's work. Out of power and increasingly frail, Fidel Castro was seen only rarely. This was January 2014. Later that year, the United States and Cuba made their biggest move towards a permanent thaw, hoping to draw a line under the past. But Fidel Castro remained a huge figure of the 20th century, and the Fidel effect will fade only slowly.
While many Cubans undoubtedly detested Fidel Castro, others genuinely loved him. They saw him as a David who could stand up to the Goliath of America, who successfully spat in the Yankee eye. For them, Castro was Cuba, and Cuba was Castro. James Robbins, BBC News. All right, ladies, so that is one clip that basically, uh, so Fidel died, he was 90 when he died, he died around 2014. And yes, sir, I remember it was like recently, quote unquote. Yes, very recently. And he, a lot of US soldiers didn't, well, not US soldiers, a lot of US presidents wanted to get rid of him, but he outlived quite a lot of them. And uh, he's uh, pretty much a very important figure throughout the world. Now I'm going to show you a short clip on the right about the Cuban Rev, and it's going to give you maybe some background information and also into the course. In today's video, we're looking at the Cuban Revolution. There are two essential questions that you should be able to answer by the end of this video. The first, what was Cuba like prior to the Cuban Revolution of 1959? And the second, who was Fidel Castro and what did he do? Let's begin by looking at some background information on Cuba from the 1930s and the early 1950s. In September 1933, a man by the name of Fulgencio Batista took control of the government of Cuba through a military coup. He was extremely right-wing, almost if not entirely fascist, and he was supported by the USA from the outset. A few months after his coup, the USA recognized his new right-wing government. In 1937, Batista allowed the formation of rival political parties. However, he controlled the government completely until 1944. And what that meant was that although some other people were elected president at this time, Batista always used them, sort of like a puppet, to actually take over real control. In 1944, he was ousted and moved to Florida. However, in 1948, he moved back to Cuba and again took up a position in government. In 1951, he began to campaign to run for president in the election of 1952. Now we need to know that in Cuba in the 1950s, government corruption was rampant, and there was a new political candidate on the scene named Fidel Castro, who was running for Congress under an anti-corruption party platform. Castro was an interesting fellow. He graduated from the University of Havana in 1950 with a degree in law, and it was during his time in university that he became interested in politics. In 1952, Castro was also running for Congress. However, in March of 1952, before the election could occur, Batista seized power, ousted the president, Carlo Prio Socaras, in a bloodless coup, and basically took over. So, due to Batista's coup, there was no Cuban election in 1952, and this prompted Castro to begin planning a popular uprising in Cuba. Castro, as we will see, had three attempts at taking over and overthrowing the Cuban government and making a change in Cuba. His first attempt was on July 26, 1953. At this time, Castro led 120 men to storm a military barracks in order to steal weapons so that he could attempt his military revolution. The result was a major fail. Many rebels were killed. Castro himself went to jail with other rebels, and basically it was horrible. Once released, Castro ran away to Mexico because Batista was going to kill him. Then again, on November 26, 1953, about three years later, Castro returned, sailing to the east coast of Cuba with 81 men. However, the moment they got to the coast, government forces ambushed them and many were killed. In fact, there were only 18 survivors, and these 18 survivors included Castro, 
Che Guevara, and Castro's brother Raul Castro. They fled to the Sierra Maestra Mountains in the south, where they stayed in There's just one error here with the video. They said here that this is the east coast of Cuba. Anybody realize that this could not be the east coast? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, that's, that's the west. west. That's this the is west the coast. West. This is the west coast, the north of Cuba, the south, the east, the west. Can't be. This cannot be the east coast. They actually went here. This is where they would have landed and they went into the mountain here. All right, not, not here this side. This is not correct. Hiding, hiding for two years, building their army, developing their political ideas, as well as their strategy. December 31st, 1958 is probably a big event to remember. Before we look at this, we need to learn a little bit more about Batista's regime. It was brutal. The rich people in Cuba did well if they rewarded Batista. There are mobsters and mafia all over the place, and Cuba basically became a playground for wealthy Americans with casinos and dancing. However, the regular Cubans were living in extreme poverty, and this made Cuban people increasingly dissatisfied with Batista's government. He was taxing them too much. They so, uh you could use the term that they were dissatisfied, right? With Batista's government. So if you are developing the point, add about poverty or any one of the points, add about Batista, you could say that they were dissatisfied with how the United States were involved in the US economically. They were, the Cubans were dissatisfied with how the Americans controlled their economy politically. They were dissatisfied with the, the, the unemployment in their country. So this is a very good term that you could also incorporate in your writing. So please write that term down, that the Cubans were more and more dissatisfied. Underline it and see if you can utilize the term. They had nothing. And a lot of this money was going to the states and also into Batista's pockets. It was very corrupt, so the Cuban people were really unhappy. On December 31st, Batista lost the support of the Cuban army, and he gathered all of his friends together and left the country going to Spain and Portugal, where he lived like a king because he had amassed a huge personal fortune. He actually died in exile in 1973. Everybody was happy that Batista had left, and Castro arrived in Havana a few days later. People loved Castro, and one of his first speeches to the Cuban public was full of powerful symbolism. This is a photo from that first speech. In it, you can see a white dove sitting on his shoulder and a white dove sitting near to where he was speaking. According to Cuban beliefs, the white dove symbolized that Castro was going to deliver Cuba from all of the bad things that had happened to it in its past and lead it towards a very bright and strong future. So Cubans were extremely happy. However, America was not so happy that they had just lost an ally that they had used to have, and now there was a seemingly communist government within about 160 kilometers from the American border. And we will see in our next videos how the Cuban Revolution led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Thanks for all right, ladies, so right there, you could also, when you are looking at the anti-imperialist uh, groups that emerge as a cause of the Cuban revolution, you could look at the symbolism that Castro would have used by having a white dove on his shoulder when he spoke to the Cuban people. You could also look at his speeches, for example, Issue Will Absolve Me, and how he would have interacted with the people to try to gain their support. All right? Now we're going to go into, I'm going to, I'm coming to Jamaica, but I need to go, I need to look at some of the, 
the the course, the timeline with the Cuban Rev. Now, in 1953, as she would have, the person in the video would have mentioned, in 1953, Fidel Castro led a group with about 120, some books say 120, but it was between 120 to 160 men, right? And they went to Santiago de Cuba and Santiago de Cuba, which is right here, because that's where he was from. Santiago de Cuba is very close to Jamaica. I had a student last year that was from that area in Cuba, Santiago de Cuba. And uh, the government of Cuba at the time, they had a military barracks there. That is where they would have stored the, the bullets and the guns and all of these different stuff. And so Castro and the 160 men, they actually went to the Mancada military base or barrack uh, to invade the base in order to get weapon. Because if you are going to fight against a government, you actually need weapons, right? Uh, but they failed at this attack on the military barracks. And so by October 1953, only 26 of the, quite a lot of the, the men that I don't want to use the word rebels, or if you want to change the word from rebels, this is so North American. If you want to change the word, they can say revolutionaries, right? They are not rebels. They fought a very good fight against that wicked man. All right, so in 1953, about 26 of them would have survived, including Fidel Castro, and they were imprisoned for about 15 years. During the time, so between 53 and 55, a lot of people say no man, but it is very, very bad in Cuba. We can't talk against the government. Uh, we can't say anything. And so what happened here was that Batista didn't want much uprising. I, I, he didn't want anybody to uprise. So he released Fidel Castro from prison. So although Fidel would have received 15 years in prison because he would have invaded uh, the barracks in 53 in order to receive weapons, he would have released Fidel from prison with his brother, Ruel Castro, in, on May the 15, 1955. Go ahead, family Lawrence. There are no more all right. Why you, you were all right? So they were released from prison, and then they went to. Then after he was released from prison, Fidel Castro was so, what I would say, scared for his life. So he went to, uh, Mexico. So he went to Mexico, July twenty six, nineteen fifty five, right, mm -hmm. and. Went to Mexico and he met with other persons, revolutionaries in Mexico, and they decided how they were going to return to Cuba to, this, to overthrow Batista. Uh, in 1956, and in fact, they would have started a movement that was called the July 26 movement. So the July 26 movement, Notice that most of the very important events that are taking place in Cuba happen on July 26. So the first uprising by Fidel Castro happened on July the 26, 1953. Again, on July 26, 1955, he went to Mexico and he returned July the 26, 1956 from Mexico 
with his revolutionaries. Go ahead, Pamela. Sir, I was just saying that um, in one of my textbooks, it said that they were released from from prison eleven months after. So I'm not sure if if it's wrong. I've seen where some textbooks. It's not a couple months alone them they spend in prison and then. Yes, then some, them. some. All right. So some books say that they would have released 11 months. And that is, that could be correct. I just need to, ver I let her verify that date. So it would seem as if. If it is October 53, it would have been released in 54. I will have to check that and get back. And I will get back to your next class, all right? Okay, sir. So in, 50, in 1956, the revolutionaries went to, uh, the revolutionaries land in Cuba and they would have launched a guerrilla attack on the state. So if you look right here, so this is all of the mountain here. And so they would have remained in the mountain and they would have attempted to take over, right? So all, most of the battles took place in the South of Cuba, the east, which is east of Cuba in the south. Havana was very militarized. And if you visit Havana today, you would see that Havana is a very military in terms of well protected. Uh, by 57, by 1957, with a small supply of weapons, Castro's followers began to attack oil facilities, government buildings, radio stations. In fact, he took over one of the radio stations in, in Cuba. And the US president, the, sorry, the US press, which is the newspaper at the time, indicated that an American trained force will undone and kill Castro, right? That is what they would have officially stated by 1958, the Cuban forces continued their battle and they were able to have their own newspapers. They were able to also get support from the from Cubans who were living outside of Cuba. Uh, with 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 our with military ammunition and all of these different stuff, they would have received some level of support from them. And then, and at the same time, while all of this was going on, there were small groups of rural people, people in the rural areas who did everything possible to have a lot of strikes and protests against the government. By 59, late 58, 59, the American government decided that they are no longer going to support Batista. And in January, on January the 1st, 1959, uh, Batista fled and they would have taken full control of Cuba and they would have marched into Havana. By January the 7th, 1959, the US recognized the new government, right? So you can see that they had some level of US support, not in the initial stage of the protest or the initial stage of the revolution, but later on they would have had support. Another popular question in the exam is the reasons for Castro's success. And one of the main reasons for Castro's success is uh, the guerrilla tactics that he would have used uh, 
quite a lot of civil resistance. So they use a lot of rural people to fight against the government at the time. Also, you have to look at the role of the US because what the US did, which was one of the reasons why Fidel Castro was successful, was that they defund or they stopped, they stopped the funding of the Batista regime. So they stopped to give them money, they stopped to give them army, and that would have completely crumbled or destroyed Batista's regime there, and it gave Fidel Castro some level of edge over the Castro government. Because what is happening now is that the Castro government, they are using the guerrilla tactics. And even though they don't have enough weapons, the guerrilla tactics proved that they were very successful. And if the Cuba, if the Americans are not giving Batista any guns and weapons, then clearly they, they, they clearly the Batista's army at the time, they would not be successful in the guerrilla tactics. They were not aware because they know that guerrilla tactics involve the ambushing of people and all of these different stuff. Another reason why Fidel was very successful was because of the popular support. He received quite a lot of popular support, especially from rural Cubans. The rich Cubans really lived in Havana. And so they got, they used the radio, so they would have captured some of the radio stations and the newspapers. And from the mountains, they are using the radio in the mountain to send message to the people. And they are printing newspapers and sending newspapers with their message to the people, what they are going to do for the Cuban if they should be successful. So people in Cuba, especially the rural people, supported him or supported the cause that they were fighting. So one, they received popular support from the, from the people, the role of the US, because the US would have defund or would have stopped funding the Batista's government and stopped uh, to give them ammunition and guns and all of these different stuff. So it allowed the Castro's guerrilla tactics to, was quite advantageous. Another reason why Castro was successful was because of the economic problems in Cuba. Yeah, the high unemployment, seasonal employment, a lot of people were dying from sickness. They don't have any doctors, people involved in uh prostitution and so as the previous video said that they were dissatisfied and so that was also a cause for the the cuban uh, a reason for his success and a reason why he gained popular support and also we can look at the military tactics that he would have had they had rural guards. They used the guerrilla tactics. They had civil resistance. And they also had friends coming in from Argentina, from Mexico, from all over the place to help them to fight against uh, the Batista's government. Go ahead for me, Lawrence. Sure, and I was saying for the um, support you could add um, to that list of university students. Yes, the role of the university students, because the university students would have supported them significantly. All right. So ladies, please note the reasons for Castro's success, because sometimes they would say, give me, explain, three causes of the Cuban revolution and discuss one reason or two reasons why Castro was successful. Note the reasons why Castro was successful. Please, I am begging you, don't go into the exam and think that they are going to ask you about cause and effects alone. Sometimes they ask you the reason why, the, why Fidel Castro was successful.
And the reason why it was successful was because of the military factors and military factors include guerrilla tactics. They use rural guard, they had their own rural little persons there. They set persons to strike. The economic reasons in Cuba gave them popular support and the role of the United States. So those are three main reasons why Fidel Castro was successful. Any other, any comment, ladies? Any comments? No, sir. No, sir. All right. So, ladies, remember on Thursday, you're going to meet in your groups and you're going to look at the different ways or different policies of Fidel Castro. And you're going to present that. I don't want a big presentation, I just want you to peel the question. So it is point, you tell me the point, the evidence, the, the evidence or example, the explanation and the link. It's like you're writing an essay in the exam. All right, so that is what you're doing on Thursday. Enjoy the rest of the day, ladies. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, sir.